So I really want to not talk about the overall adaptive leadership model today, but I want to talk about measurement. We're still asking teams to be agile, but we're still measuring them in a more traditional way. And so I really want to talk today about some ideas around measurement in organizations because I think that's what ultimately changes behavior. So one of the things we did in the Agile movement is we started talking about velocity. And I wrote a blog entry uh, six or seven months ago that velocity was killing agility. I had 8,000 hits on my website in about four days and it brought it down. <laughs> Let's just give you a couple of examples. So I was working with a company uh, a few years ago, had about 600 people in development. And they were really focused in on, the, the, the VP was focused in on better quality. But they got to measuring velocity. And if velocity at the team level was OK, then maybe velocity at the product level was OK. And they ended up reporting total velocity in the organization at the VP level once a week. And after a year of this, the VP says, why is my quality so low? Because they were basically, when you try to normalize velocity across teams and roll it up in the organization, you might as well be plotting a chart of hours expended. So they were using velocity in the wrong way, far more than what it was intended to, which would be a help at the team level to manage capacity. I was also I was working with a ThoughtWorks team in the US, uh, just kind of seeing how things were going with this team uh, a while back. And I said, well, how's the, how's the project going? They said, it's going great. I said, is the customer happy? Yeah, the customer's pretty happy. We're turning stuff out. Uh, we're delivering stories. They seem to be pretty happy about what we're, what's going on. And so we talked like this for a little while and said, uh, you know, but th there's one little niggling thing that, that happens every now and then is they, they ding us on velocity. I said, so what are you reporting to them? Velocity. What else are you reporting to them? Well, nothing really. So I really want to talk a little bit about measurements and this is one of my favorite quotes. It's a little bit long by a senior consultant. Um, I recently challenged a CIO whether he would prefer to deliver a project somewhat late and over budget, but rich with business benefits, or one that is on time and under budget, but of scant value to the business. He thought it was a tough call. <laughs> and then went for the on time scenario. Delivering on time and within budget wasn't part of his IT performance metrics. Chasing a business value over which he thought he had little control is not. And that's endemic in a lot of organizations all the way down to the project level. And I think that's one of the things that we need to change. The other thing that happens in agile teams sometimes, if, you, if you've worked on an agile project, have you ever been in this dilemma? Be flexible, be agile, be adaptable, but meet the plan. And that plan is usually the traditional plan of scope, schedule, and cost, right? It's the traditional iron triangle. So I think we need to figure out how to get away from that. One more thing about measurement in general before I kind of move on is one of, the, one of the better books on measurement was written by Rob Austin, who used to be a Harvard Business School professor, now is the dean of business at a college in uh, New England. And this is kind of interesting. Uh, basically, the kind of the theme of the book is all measurement's dysfunctional, and it causes exactly the opposite behavior of what you intended. And one of the reasons for that is, here's the way measurement systems go. You measurement system and install. And then performance begins to improve until people figure out what you're measuring. And then they adapt to that. And what happens is, oftentimes, the measurement goes up. So your performance measure goes up, but the actual desired outcome goes down. And think of the traditional thing in the IT environment. Programmer productivity by lines of code, right? As lines of code go up for a while, that's good. And then after a while, it's bad because they're just focused on lines of code. So in any measurement system, we have to think about some of these issues around what makes decent measurements. There's a, an interesting book that was written last year by a couple of guys at McKinsey uh, called Beyond Performance. And, and really, they're talking about the most important question facing leaders today is to build an organization that delivers results today and changes fast enough to be relevant tomorrow. So it delivers results, performance, and changes fast enough to be relevant tomorrow. And that really has to deal with something I'll call organizational help. But this is kind of the model of tomorrow and in the future, two things are going to drive success, right? 
getting our customers and keeping customers and building solutions for customers, number one. And number two, attracting, training, retaining best talent. Because if you're going to operate in a world where we need to be responsive to the outside world and responsive to customers, we've really got to have talented individuals. And so how do you both perform for customers and, and have an organization in which talent really wants to work? So it really has to do with performance and organizational health, whereas kind of a simplified what I talk about is being agile and doing agile. So you've heard a lot of this stuff about health before. Is it really important? Is it really important that people have high morale? Is it really important to have low turnover? Is it really important that people are passionate about their job? Again, from beyond performance. Organizations that focus on performance and health simultaneously were nearly twice as successful as those that focused on health alone and nearly three times as successful as those that focused on performance alone. So if you've got your choice, one or the other, it's actually better for long-term performance to focus on organizational health than it is to focus on performance measures. Now, who are these two guys? You know, there's lots of management theorists out there. There's a lot of people that come around, write these big, you know, management books about theory X and theory Y or whatever. So what, what do these guys get off telling us this? They're two guys from McKinsey, the premier management consulting firm in the world, and they have this kind of data to back up those claims. 600,000 respondents to their surveys, uh, nearly 500 companies, nearly 6,000 senior executives, 7,000 senior executives. So this is backed up by some of the, you know, a really a lot of data. So organizational health and performance are both important. Uh, I wouldn't do one or the other to do both. What else about measurement? Well, one of the things is that measurement needs to be holistic and multidimensional. You need to look at a variety of numbers together, not one single number or not two single numbers. And you need to look at it overall and not just focus in on one thing like velocity or whatever it is you're looking at. So this was a quote by Bajarte who spoke at this conference last year. Performance evaluation is a holistic assessment of delivery and behavior. And again, by the CEO of Gore. You know, you get a lot of negative behavior when you narrow, when you look at narrow metrics. So these are some of the things that we need to think about in terms of measurement. So my adaptive leadership model looks something like this, and I'm not going to go into this in much detail because that would take a whole, uh, another hour, and Luke wants to say something. Uh, <laughs> but really, the, the middle is about the why. It's about envisioning a responsive enterprise and why that's important. And the left-hand side is really about execution levers that management has to make uh, things like continuous delivery and continuous delivery of value to the customers go better. And the right-hand side is really about behaviors. So what I want to do this afternoon is sort of zero in on a couple of these things that I think are particularly important about measuring. First of all is to create a value-focused culture. There's been a lot of talk in the Agile movement of, over the years about really focusing in on value and doing the highest valued story next and looking at value. And I think it has brought a whole kind of value orientation, but I don't think we've taken it far enough yet. Uh, really, Mike talked earlier uh, before lunch about the value in government in terms of really focusing on the user and, and really bringing that value out. So to have a value-based culture and to make it visible Make it visible to people from the top to the bottom. Somebody was asking me at a break earlier, well, what about value at a feature level? And I said, I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. Uh, to really look at a value framework. What are, the, what are the drivers of value in your organization? At every level, at a portfolio level, a company level, portfolio level, all the way down to an iteration. And make it actionable. Make it easy. As I often tell people, it is better to have a measurement that's fuzzy that's about something important than to have a measure that's precise that's about something unimportant. One of the reasons we have such good measures about cost is that it's easy. One of the reasons we have poor measures around value is that it's harder and it's fuzzier, and we don't really like those fuzzy numbers. But oftentimes they're more important. 
So again, in the Agile movement, one of the things that happened when we first got started in the Agile movement is we were still sort of bound by the old traditional iron triangle of scope, schedule, and cost, right? The old project management iron triangle of scope, schedule, and cost. And so the first thing we did in the Agile movement, usually the peak is up at the top in that scope. So the first thing we did is say, aha, let's just turn it upside down, right? And so the, the scope was in the bottom, and that was kind of to indicate that we'd let scope move, we'd do time box development, and kind of let scope change. But we're still measuring the same things. And I actually think we need to measure different things. And the things that I think we need to measure are value, quality, and constraints. And that actually scope, schedule, and cost are not objectives, they're constraints. And they're very important constraints. It's not to say they're unimportant. But number one is, are we delivering anything valuable to the customer? And if we're not, it doesn't matter how much time it takes or how much it costs. And secondly, quality. And I want to talk about quality a little bit later. The other thing about value is we ask a different strategic question. We don't ask the question, did I develop or did I deliver all of the stories that we had planned? Right? That's a bottom-up scope-oriented question. The question is, can I release the product at the end of this iteration? Can I release it? Does it have enough functionality, enough value to the customer that I can go ahead and release this thing? So it's a kind of a continuous look at value. And then quality really has two components. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit more depth later. One is, is it reliable today? And is it adaptable tomorrow? In an era of continuous delivery, it's not so important that I can do it once, but can I do it over and over and over and over again? So first of all, let's take a look at sort of uh, an overall sort of enterprise look at value. And I want to just emphasize here that they're kind of a couple of different kinds of value. There's quantitative values about profitability and revenue and those kinds of things. And then there's qualitative value about things like purpose and social responsibility and those kinds of things that are, that are a little different. Uh, Facebook, right, is in the news a lot today, uh, these days because of their recent IPO. Their purpose is to make the world more open and connected. Their purpose isn't about making money. Their purpose is to make money in order to carry out that purpose. And so, from this kind of a look for your particular business at what, what your kind of value model is, the next thing to do is to develop some value dials. So these are much more specific. They can, they, they can be purpose oriented or they can be financials. Uh, some of these examples come from the Gap uh, in, in the US. Pat Reed is a director at the Gap and she's sort of taking this value engineering thing to a few additional steps. In fact, these next couple of slides actually Pat put together. So once you have something like this uh, that your product owners, product managers, and, and teams can use, then you can begin the process of kind of assigning value. Because you need to really look at value differently than you look at cost. One of the things uh, that I realized early on is, is you can't intrinsically look at a feature or a story and say, this is worth so many value points, right? You can look at a story and say, this is going to cost us 10 story points to build. But you can't look at a story and say, this is, this, this is 10 value points worth of value. So you really have to allocate value from the top down, not calculate it from the bottom up. And so what you do for a particular project or application or release is you assign a value. And if you can do relative value or absolute value. The easiest thing to do is relative value. Just like story points are relative cost, you can look at relative value and then allocate that cost down. So on the left-hand side of this chart, you'll see that from a portfolio position, you begin allocating those values down, while on the right-hand side, you add story points up. So what you end up with is for every feature, and usually we would do it at a feature level, you have a value point calculation and you have a story point calculation. And you can begin to look at those things in, in parallel, right? not just the cost side, but also the value side. One of the things you can do with this value side is because you capture value incrementally over the life of a release or an iteration in Agile, you can continue to kind of ask this question, have we gone far enough? Would I rather have 100% of the value for 100% of the cost? Or would I rather have 90% of the value for 75% of the cost? Because 
it may be that the next most valuable feature is on the next project. Right? So you always want to be asking this question, can I ship this today and this is it and I'm going on to the next one, rather than you know, just doing all these stories because I said I needed to do all these stories. But look at it from a value perspective. And this is just a chart uh, about the allocation of that and how you would go about actually allocating down to features. There was a book that was written five or six years ago, and I forget the, the title of it right now, that sort of did this same thing. But they went through all of these really, really intricate calculations. And the thing about value is it really serves two purposes. One, so that everybody understands that value is important. And if I can drive value down to the feature level, I show people on the team that it's, it's important. It's important to everybody. And number two, can it help me make some prioritization decisions, right? So it does, it, a fuzzy number is good enough for what we're trying to do here. You don't have to be right, a very precise number. And so you have features that have not only value points and story points. Now, they're in different dimensions, right? So you can't just look at this and say, you know, and compare them directly. But you can kind of say, well, you know, this feature is worth 25 value points, uh, and it only costs three story points. That's probably a pretty good trade-off, as opposed to the opposite way around. And then you actually can report these in different ways. This is a parking lot diagram, which really shows at a, at a um, sort of capability and a feature and a story level what's been done and what hasn't been done. This is really a client-oriented report as opposed to a Gantt chart, which is really a time and activity type of report. So it begins illustrating value in a little bit different way. So that's a little bit about value. What about quality? Is quality really important? So I actually, a, a colleague of mine took this picture in China. How many of you have seen something like this to lead into a quality discussion? Okay. And they talk about, you know, all the needs. And then what do we talk about? Then what happens is, this is a lead in, right? This is terrible. It's awful. And this is a lead in to a discussion about code quality or design quality or automated testing or technical debt reduction. I know there's some non-IT, more product business-oriented people in the room. And for you, for the business partners of software development IT, all of this is blah, 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 blah. Right? You don't, they don't care. One of the problems we've had in the past and still have today is this is the trade-off equation we give to our business partners. Do you want features, more features, or do you want higher quality? Do you want more features, or would you like a lower McCabe com complexity metric, cyclomatic complexity metric, right? What are your business partners going to say? Duh, you know, I want a lower McCabe cyclomatic complexity index, of course. <laughs> what we're doing here is we're asking our business partners to trade off a business outcome for a technical outcome, and it's never going to happen. Right? So what if? What if we could change the equation? What if we had something that we could trade off against features so that we were trading off a business outcome against a business outcome, as opposed to a business outcome versus a technical outcome? And my contention is that that is cycle time. And that cycle time is something that's important to the business. How rapidly can I get features through the development pipeline, and how frequently do I release? There's two kinds of cycle time there. So now all I have to do is I have to prove or show or hypothesize that higher quality gives us lower cycle time. And I made this pitch uh, in, in Australia a few months ago, and somebody said, but Jim, we know that you can trade off quality for features because in a project, you can do less testing, right? Or you could do less refactoring, or you could do less design, and you could, you could then turn out more features, and so there is a trade-off there. And I got to thinking about that. And I said, yes, that's true if you do it once. If you follow sort of the waterfall model of lots of development up front and then a little maintenance in the beginning, in the back, what happens is, the feedback from poor quality is long-term, right? Months and months, years and years. And 
and you, consequences of low quality are really difficult to determine. Well, I know it's no, low quality, but how did that happen and where did it happen? And the recovery is really big, right? However, once cycle time tends to go down, once you begin delivering on a continuous delivery, a continuous deployment basis, once every week or once every month, the whole equation changes because if I have low quality in one iteration, it will show up pretty quickly, two or three iterations down the road. Right? So the more I go to continuous delivery type of model, the more that I have to really focus on cycle time. And in fact, if we really focus on, on, on reducing cycle time, right, we will actually, in the end, be able to do lower cycle time and more features, but we got to get there first. Right? So feedback is immediate, and it's a matter of weeks, and the consequences of low technical quality are easier to determine. As somebody said earlier, you know, if I release or I deploy something today and something breaks, I only have to look back a day, right, to my changes for the previous day or the previous week to find out what happened. So I actually think in a continuous delivery environment, the closer you get, the, the shorter the cycle time is, you really begin looking at features versus cycle time. And cycle time is a business outcome that's driven by quality, but I don't have to engage the business partners in all this discussion about technical debt and cyclomatic complexity and that kind of stuff. So the goal is not features. The goal is a continuous stream of value. It's really different when you begin looking at this thing on a continuous basis. So a single release encourages trade-offs, aggregate releases, uh, encourage business trade-offs of a right kind. And as I said, there are two kinds of cycle times. So I want to talk just for a minute about some organizational health issues, and I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm just kind of kind of touch on these. And actually a colleague of mine, James Brett from Australia, uh, gave me this chart yesterday, which I really like. Now this is really at a project level, but on the left you have sort of organizational health issues around team mode, collaboration, leadership support. On the right-hand side, you have sort of performance issues, and you have a kind of a bar in there as to where, how you're doing. But this is the kind of thing that's multidimensional, it's holistic, and it, enc it encompasses both organizational health and performance. I really like this chart. So I, I asked James, I said, can I, said, can I steal that for you for today? And <laughs> he said, yeah. And then... How do you, do you evaluate yourself as a management team? And, and I, since I haven't talked about all these things over on the left-hand side, uh, you may or may not know what they stand for. But, for example, have you evaluated yourself as a management team on your ability to adapt to change over time? Uh, and then how adaptable do you think you need to be? How exploratory do you need to think you need to be? And how are you doing in those dimensions? So an evaluation over time of management behaviors that you're exhibiting that will allow the organization as a whole become more responsive, more adaptive. And then there are some companies around who do full kind of 360 light evaluations. This is one from a company in the States called Agility Consulting, and I realize you can't read that, uh, but it really is a bunch of questions about, you know, things or behaviors that really point to organizations and, and management that's more, uh, more agile. So what about all of this stuff from a financial perspective? Does it make any difference from an organizational financial perspective? Because these are really intangible things, right? Organizational health is intangible. It's not on the balance sheet, right? You can't go on a balance sheet and say organizational health, you know, 500,000 pounds. But there have been some studies done that really talk about the impact of intangibles on market value. And one of the things you can see is over the years that the percentage of market capitalization attributed to intangibles versus tangibles has gone up significantly. So whereas today, or this actually was 2000, 85% of market capitalization was based on Wall Street's estimate of people's intangible qualities, of their leadership, of their training, of their patents, of those kinds of things that are not on the balance sheet. And I ran a little analysis uh, recently of, of Exxon versus Apple. Apple's worth more money, you know, market cap, 
than Exxon. And yet Exxon has more resources, more people, more total revenue, all of these kinds of things. And it has to do with the intangible balance. And so financially, things like organizational health uh, and, and, and being able to respond quickly in the marketplace make a big difference. So the competitive advantage, and this is back to Keller and Price, the uh, McKinsey guys, the competitive advantage of the 21st century is increasingly derived from hard to copy intangible assets, such as company culture and leadership effectiveness. Thank you.